Welcome to RadioTrivia.com, the fastest hour in radio, bringing you back to yesterday by making radio fun again. And now, here are your hosts, Mark Bornstein and Bruce Kaplan. Well, good morning, Puget Sound, and welcome to another edition of RadioTrivia.com. My name is Mark Bornstein, along with my co-host, Bruce Kaplan, and we're glad to be with you this morning. Uh, we're sponsored by the good folks at U Park Parking Lots, where the customer is always number one, and they have locations throughout the greater Puget Sound area. And we're also sponsored by The Force Realty. Let The Force sell your home or help you buy a new home. They utilize the latest in internet technology to provide you with buyers from all over the world. Call The Force today at 425-444-2084. Look, you need someone to look after you. Why aren't you in school? <laughs> I I graduated. Well, that's a pretty lame excuse. <laughs> and besides, I don't believe it. Well, Gracie, come inside and I'll show you my sheepskin. You leave your clothes on, young man. <laughs> now, look here, Gracie. Really, I, I've been tutored. I've had an education. Well, we'll see whether you have or not. Spell cat. Cat? <laughs> Too tough for you, huh? <laughs> well, I'll give you a simpler word. Spell two. T O T W O or T O O. Oh no, you don't get three guesses. <laughs> you're, you're really in a bad shape. Look, Gracie, I went to school. Just ask me questions about literature, economics, chemistry, physics, anything. Go ahead. All right, let's take chemistry. All right. Who's the president of the United States? <laughs> That, uh, that, Gracie, is unrelated subject matter. No, sir. That's Harry S. Truman. <laughs> I mean, chemistry has nothing to do with the president. Chemistry is when you put a whole lot of strange things together and get gas or something. Now, that's Congress. <laughs> this is Bruce Kaplan welcoming you back to another episode of Radio Trivia. Hope that you're all enjoying a wonderful weekend. First, I want to mention a thank you to my radio buddy, Susan, who always makes me smile with her beautiful messages. I often meet people who love to listen to Kixie, but the young fellow that I met the other day when I was picking up my mail was really somebody who impressed me. By a young fellow, he was probably in his early 50s, but he told me a message about our old-time radio that really surprised me. From the time he was in his 30s, He'd been treated for high blood pressure. Every day, he'd take his medication, and then a while later, his blood pressure readings. For years, he took his readings in the morning, but one day he forgot and monitored his pressure after listening to a comedy show on Kixie. He was surprised to see that his results were greatly improved. To this day, he's continued on with his experiment. He told me he loves the relaxing music of yesterday, and the comedy really soothes his nerves. I guess we could say, Kixie, this may be the anecdote for hypertension. This morning, hopefully, will make your blood pressure plummet to the healthiest levels ever as we listen to The Life of Riley and Our Miss Brooks. Thanks so much for tuning in to this great station, and if you want to reach me, please don't hesitate to write to Bruce at Radiotrivia.com. No one can say that Chester A. Riley isn't a kind, thoughtful, considerate husband. Witness the scene that is taking place in the Riley kitchen right now. Riley is reading the evening paper. Mrs. Riley is doing the supper dishes. And as she bends over the sink... Oh! Peg, what's the matter? Ah, uh, Nothing. Well, don't say nothing. I, I heard you. No, it, it's nothing, Riley. But why are you holding your back like that? Uh, have you got a pain, honey? <laughs> no, it, it's going away. It always does. You mean you've had this pain before? Well, I, I get it sometime when I bend over to think. It's really nothing. Oh, read your paper. Forget it. Well, no, I, I will not. What kind of a husband do you take me for? You expect me to just sit here reading while you're bending over that pile of dishes and... No, I'm going to put a stop to that. I'm taking you to the doctor as soon as you finish those dishes. 
I don't need a doctor. I'm all right. Well, we'll let the doctor decide that. It's just a waste of five dollars to go to a doctor for this. <laughs> just tell me to apply a heating pad. Yeah, don't be such a pessimist. Maybe he'll tell you you need an operation. <laughs> so, Riley, I'm not going to a doctor, and that's all there is to it. Well, you're scared. I'm not scared. Don't be silly. Well, Peg, I'm surprised that you. You're acting like a child. Well, what's there to be scared of? Today, modern surgery can perform miracles. I know that. Well, I was reading a magazine about an operation. It was just marvelous, a perfect piece of surgery. This patient had trouble with his ticker, see? So they cut open his chest, sawed through the ribs, lifted out the heart, and put it on a table. And they kept it ticking all the time while they worked on it. They drained out the red corpse suckles and pumped in the white corpse. <laughs> Sort of a loop job. <laughs> then they put the heart back in, pushed the ribs together, and sewed up his chest. And the man lived? Well, no, but it was a perfect piece of surgery. <laughs> Mr. Riley, you can come in now. Oh, well, how is she? What did you find? Will she need an operation? Oh, no, it's nothing like that, Mr. Riley. Just those strain muscles. She'll be all right if she applies some heat. Oh, is that all? <laughs> so, you see, Peg, I told you there's nothing to be scared of. Well, thank you, Doctor. Goodbye. I'll see that she takes it easier for a few days. Don't let her exert herself. No laundry, no vacuuming the rugs, no heavy housework. Oh, that's yeah, sure thing, Doc. My little wife needs a rest. She's going to get it. The kids will do the work. Fine. Well, so long, Doc. Oh, uh, just a minute, Riley. Come over here. Me? Yes, I want to have a look at you. Oh, there's nothing wrong with me. I want to look at your eyes. They're brown. <laughs> hmm. That's interesting. Yeah, but I can see perfect, Doc. Now open your mouth. Yeah, but Doc... Oh, wider. I... Say, ah. Ah. Ah, that's what I saw. Those tonsils will have to come up right away, too. You, you mean an operation? Well, there was a peg. He's after me. Ah, oh, Riley, what's the matter? Well, he's got a batch of tonsils there. The sooner they come up, the better. Oh, really? Oh, no, you ain't going to operate on me. Nobody's going to cut me up. No, I don't believe in operations. No. Nonsense. Now, you'll be at the hospital day after tomorrow at 9 o'clock. No, I won't go. You can't make me. I I don't need no operation. I won't go. Now, the peg, you tell him. Uh... He'll be there, Doctor. No, no. This is a frame-up. I won't go. But, Riley, dear, I'm surprised at you. But you're acting like a child. I don't want no operation. <laughs> What's there to be scared of? Today, modern surgery can perform miracles. Why, of course. And a tonsillectomy isn't really an operation. Well, I've done so many, I could take your tonsils out blindfolded. Oh, yeah? <laughs> well, if you want to get paid, you better peek. <laughs> Hi there, Gillis. Oh, hi, Riley. Uh, how's the ankle, Gillis? Yeah, coming along okay. Still swollen with a swelling. Uh, well, sit down on the steps here. Here, here give me your crutches. Thanks, sir. Uh, How long do you still have to use these crutches? Oh, about another week. A week, huh? Well, it'll make three weeks you're laid up with that ankle. Well, that's tough. What's tough about it? No weight, take it easy, sleep as late as they want, family waits on me hand and feet, and I get paid every week from the company hospital flat. Uh, sure, I, I never looked at it like that. Yeah, you're, you're lucky, all right. I gotta have my tonsils out, but I'll be back at work after one day. Imagine, I've been chunking in good dough to company plan every week just as long as you. And for once, I'm lucky enough to need an operation, turns out to be tonsils. Why couldn't I get something that would lay me up at least a month there? Ah, cheer up. <clears throat> Come on, I'll buy you a bottle of Pat's Blue Rip. Oh, okay. Hey, why, why couldn't I have dropped a rivet gun on my ankle like you did? That I'd be going around on crutches, too, and... Kill it! Your crutches. You're walking without crutches. Oh, yeah, I forgot. I better run back and get them. <laughs> there might be a company spy around. Gillis, you can walk without them. You don't even limp. Okay, Riley, you caught me with my crutches down. <laughs> well, what's the idea? You can walk. Oh, sure. I was able to walk three days after the accident. I figured I'd drag it out a couple of weeks. Well, you sure fooled me. Your ankle looks so swollen. Yeah, well, that part's a nuisance. 
Whenever the swelling starts going down, I give it a little bang with the crutch to swell it up. <laughs> Huh? <laughs> I wish I had the guts to try a stunt like that. <laughs> well, why don't you? How are you going to bang your tonsils with a crutch? <laughs> don't tell them it's tonsils. Build it up. Say it's a serious operation. Lay up for a month. They'll never find out. Yeah, but give us that ain't honest. That's, that's like stealing. Oh, look who's talking. Ain't you the guy who showed me how to get a nickel back from a payphone by banging it? <laughs> Ain't you the guy who's always using old transfers on buses? And when you go to a restaurant, you order a steak, eat three quarters of it, then you start yelling to the waiter, it's no good, you make him bring you another one. That ain't stealing. Well, yeah, but that's legitimate stealing. As a citizen, I'm entitled to it. Until I get caught. Well, so is this legitimate. After all, whose money are you collecting anyway? Not the company. Yours. Yeah, that's right. I've been paying for ten years, and I never took advantage once. And I could have lots of times. During the war, there was plenty of times I was sick as a dog, but I went to work anyway. Even when I had temperature. And that time I had bronchitis. And when I had pleurisy, I never took a day off. Not once. Not even when I got my head caught in a cement mixer. <laughs> no, that time I did take a half a day off while they fixed the cement mixer. Yeah. <laughs> I paid in enough dough. I'm entitled to get some of it back. I'm going to do it. Out of four. Only, well, 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 suppose they find out. Well, how can they? I'm the only one who knows what you're up to. Yes, that's right. And I can trust you, can I? Well, you know you can trust me. What a question. <laughs> in the first place, I'm your best friend. We've been pals for 20 years. Yeah. And in the second place, if you squeal on me, I'll squeal on you. <laughs> Gillis, old pal, I know I can trust you to the limit. <laughs> uh, Mr. Stevenson. Yeah. Oh, oh, it's you, Riley. Yeah. Can, I, can I see you a minute, boss? Hey, but you bought that overtime pay, we owe you. you'll get the 25. Yeah, but, boss, I told you there's $50 coming to me. No, right? Riley, only 25. No, 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 boss, 50. Look, I'll show you. Eight hours. All later. right, all right. I won't quibble over a few dollars. You'll get your 50. Oh, thanks, boss. That 50 bucks will come in handy. Now that I'm going to the hospital. Well, that's fine. I hope. Hospital? But, yeah. That's what I really came to see you about. I. I need an operation. Oh, well, I'm sorry to hear that, Riley. Nothing serious, I hope. Well, kind of. My ticker. Your heart? Yeah. Something with the red corpse suckles. <laughs> well, Riley, I, I didn't know they operated for a heart condition. Uh, it was, it, but it, it's a new kind of operation. Oh, yes, yeah. yes, I think I read about that in the magazine. A marvelous operation. They practically took the heart out and then put it back in again. Miraculous. Of course, the patient didn't leave. Yeah. <laughs> Don't you worry, Riley. You'll come through. Yeah, I'll be laid up for around... Three weeks. Oh, don't worry about that. Take all the time you want. Main thing is to get well and strong again. And remember, when you come back here, your job is waiting for you. Oh, thanks, boss. Uh, when is the operation? Uh, tomorrow morning, 9 o'clock. Well, good luck, Riley. I'm I'm rooting for you. I just want to say that I can't say it. I got a great big lump in my throat. Yeah. Yeah, I know how you feel, boss. I got two big lumps in my throat. <laughs> This is a nice, bright room you got, dear. You know, some hospitals... Well, now, well, what time is it, Peg? Well, almost nine, dear. Already? Well, what's the matter, dear? You nervous? N me? Nervous? Well, why should I be nervous? <laughs> it's only it's a tonsil me. operation. There's nothing to be scared of. Well, who's scared? I ain't the least bit scared. I'm no coward. Well, then stop chewing your gown. Uh, uh... All right, Mrs. Riley, on the stretcher. We're ready for you. No! No, I ain't going. Let me go. I don't want an operation. I want to go home. <laughs> oh, Riley, stop that. Now, don't be silly. Peg, I'm scared. Why, a minute ago you said you weren't a coward. Yeah, sure I said it. I'm not only a coward, I'm a liar, too. <laughs> now, come on, Mr. Riley. The doctor's waiting in surgery on the second. No. Oh, come, come on. on, Riley. Fight nothing. 
Zip, zip, and it's all over. Yeah, well, zip, zip, you get on a stretcher. <laughs> Mr. Riley, if you don't get on the stretcher, yeah, okay, I'll just... Okay, oh, okay. I'll go quietly. I know what I'm like. Thanks. Kiss me. Good luck. Good luck, dear. Now you, nurse. <laughs> Riley. Uh-huh. Excuse me. I'm so scared I don't know what I'm doing. <laughs> Goodbye, Peg. And remember, I always loved you. Well, you pay the bill, Peg? It's all settled. How do you feel, Riley? Ah, well, it hurts a little when I swallow, but I feel great. Oh, that's good. Hard to believe that only a couple of hours ago... I was under the knife. I told you it was nothing. <laughs> you told me. Oh. All right, Mr. Riley, you're discharged. You can go home now. Ah, that's right. well. Well, what are we waiting for? Let's go, Peg. Uh, Mr. Riley. Well, come on, Peg. Why hang around here? Let's go home. Come on. Uh, Mr. Riley, uh, don't you think you'd better get out of that nightgown first and put your pants on? Oh, oh. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> uh, well, just for being fresh, nurse, I ain't changing my will. I was going to leave this hospital in my brain, but now I'm not. <laughs> well, you hold on to it, dear. You'll never know when you'll need it. Uh, Anything wrong, Mr. Stevenson? You look worried. I am, Billy. I'm worried about Riley. That's a serious operation. Poor devil. What time is it? Twelve o'clock. I should have some news by now. Get me to the hospital. Yes, sir. An awful thing to go through. And I, I didn't realize he was a sick man. Looked a picture of hell. Here you are. Hello? Blueview Hospital. Now, I'd like some information about a patient, Riley, Chester Riley. Oh, one moment, please. I'll check. Thank you. Millie, uh, don't forget to send Riley flowers. Hello? Yes, yes. How is Riley? Mr. Riley's gone. <laughs> <laughs> Gone. But but he was just operated on this morning. Well, it was all over very quickly. <laughs> Gone. What's the matter, Mr. Stevenson? Never mind the flowers, Millie. Riley's dead. <gasps> oh. Just a few minutes ago, Mr. Stevenson, Riley's boss, dialed the number of the Blue View Hospital, listened to the terse words from the nurse at the other end of the line, turned pale, and as the receiver fell from his limp grasp, he was heard to exclaim in a voice choked with emotion, Poor oh, Riley, he's dead. Ah, but little does Mr. Stevenson know that at this very moment, Riley is very much alive. Reclining comfortably in his bed at home, he's living the life of Riley at the company's expense. Ah, this is the life, Peg, lying in bed, nothing to do but read and eat, sleep late in the morning, no time clock to punch. Oh, three weeks of this and I'll never want to go back to work. Three weeks? Yeah. What are you talking about? Oh, yeah, that's right. I didn't tell you, did I? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> You'll be well enough to go back to work tomorrow. Ah, I'm going to stretch it to three weeks, a month maybe, maybe even a fortnight. <laughs> <laughs> That's crazy. You won't get paid. Ah, uh -huh, you're forgetting about the company's sick benefit plan. Uh, Mr. Stevenson won't give you three weeks' pay for tonsils. <laughs> Who's got tonsils? <laughs> I told him I'm having a heart operation. <laughs> what? Oh, Riley, how could you tell such a lie? I hate such a lie. After all, my heart's only a few inches from my tonsils. <laughs> Riley... You you can't do this. I, I won't let you. Why not? Stevenson fell for it hook, line, and sinker. Don't worry, he says to me. Stay home as long as you want. The main thing is to get well, and there'll always be your job waiting for you. Oh, what a chump. <laughs> How did he ever get to be the head of a big company? I got more brains than my tonsils. <laughs> Riley. Oh, you can't be serious about this. 
It's, it's dishonest. Oh, look who's talking about honesty. Oh. Why, I never did a dishonest thing in my life. No? I've seen the way you buy strawberries in the market. <laughs> you take all the big strawberries from the top layer of all the other boxes and fill up a box of your own. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Yeah, well, you get me to do it. Uh, what about the time we went to that banquet? You bought a dress at the May Company, wore it to the banquet, and the next day you returned it and got your money back. Uh. Well, it, it, it didn't fit. It, it was too tight. Yeah, well, who told you to eat so much at the banquet? <laughs> We're talking about tonsils. Now, look, Riley, I won't let you do this. Now, Peg, my head is made up. I won't let you. Do you hear? I won't now, let please, you. please, please. Don't get me excited. Remember my heart condition. Oh. I mean, uh... uh, uh You're going to phone Mr. Stevenson and tell him you didn't have an operation. Tell him it was postponed. I will not. Then I will. Oh, you wouldn't dare. Oh, wouldn't I? Just watch me. No, wait, wait, no, no, Peg, wait, no. Wait, 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 okay. Okay, you win. I'll tell him when I go to work tomorrow. Well, now that's more like it. And the next time you try to pull oh, a stunt oh, like that, that's you're... enough. I... Oh, there's somebody at the door. Hey, shut my door on the way out. Will you think you want to take a little nap? All right, I'm coming. I'm coming. Yes. Oh, it's you. Yes, it is I indeed, Digby O'Dell, the friendly undertaker. <laughs> <laughs> My goodness, Mr. Odell, you rang that bell loud enough to wake the dead. Believe me, I'd be the last person who'd want to do that. <laughs> May I come in? Certainly. My dear Mrs. Riley, I heard the sad news about your spouse this morning. I expected you to tell me. Please accept my deepest sympathy. Oh, don't be so grim, Mr. Odell. Ah, you're a brave little woman. Tell me, did he suffer much? Oh, no. It was all over in a minute. Bully for him. He's much better off this way. That's what I keep telling them down at the office. <laughs> it had to happen sooner or later. The sooner the better. Oh, if only everybody had that attitude. May I see him now? Of course. In the bedroom. What's the matter? Twenty-five years in the business. This is the first time I've ever heard one of them snore. Oh, is he snoring? Well, wake him up. Who, me? (laughs) He's walking. Now I've seen everything. What's the matter with you, Digger? You look as if you've seen a ghost. I have. Who, me? (laughs) Riley, a ghost? Believe me, Digger, I'm very much alive. (laughs) It's no laughing matter. The whole neighborhood is in mourning. Oh, you're kidding. Out of respect for you, the pool room has closed its doors for the rest of the day. (laughs) Why, this is fantastic. How did such a rumor start? Why? I don't believe it. I assure you it's true. I passed Riley's flat a little while ago. The flag is at half mast. The men congregated in little groups, spoke of nothing else. Heart condition, they said. Heart condition? Chester Riley, you and your ideas. I knew something like this would happen. Oh, I've told you time and time again. Why can't you act like a normal human being? Hello? Hello, Mrs. Riley. This is Carl Stevenson. Oh, Mr. Stevenson. I've heard the sad news. (laughs) I'm in the neighborhood with some of dear Chester's friends. We'd like to drop in and pay our last respects to a fine soul whose departure has saddened us all. But, Mr. Stevenson... Don't try to talk. I know how you feel, but you must be brave. (laughs) We'll be right over. Mr. Stevenson, hello. Hello. Uh, Well, that was Mr. Stevenson. He's coming right over to pay his respects to your widow. How are you going to get out of that one, Peg? 
Oh, oh, I'm really dead. Mm-hmm. Uh, Laugh this one off. What'll I do? What, what, what'll I do? Hey, when he gets here, you, you tell him that I... That, that, that tell you, him what? Well, tell him that you... Well, you, you think of something. Tell him I... I oh, I, 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 no, no, not me. Because I'm not going to be here. Yeah, but Peg... Uh, you yeah. got yourself into this. Now you get yourself out. You're not going to pass the buck to me. I'm going to lock myself in Babs' room and stay there. No, Peg, wait. Peg, a fine wife I got. Sticker, what'll I do? If Stevenson finds out I lied, I'll lose my job. How did this story about my being dead get started anyway? I... That's him. What I do, Digger? Oh, I wish. I wish. That's it. That's it. I'll play dead for a few minutes, and then he'll go away, and I'm safe. Riley, you can't get away with that. Well, playing dead's my only chance. If he finds out I'm alive, he'll kill me. <laughs> Come on. Come on, in the bedroom. But, my dear man, playing dead, it is unethical, is it? Well, don't argue, Digger. It's my funeral. In that case, lie down. Okay. Close your eyes. Yeah. Fold your hands. Yeah, what else? Now, if you could only stop... No, I guess not. <laughs> let him in. But don't let him get too close to me. I had onions for lunch. Right here. Come in, gentlemen. I'm Carl Stevenson. I'm Digby Rodell. Oh, yes. Oh, of course, I've seen your advertisements on the bus benches. <laughs> These are Chester's friends, Mr. Durkin, Mr. Shapiro. Yes, we've met. How do you do, gentlemen? How do you do, Mr. Shapiro? Is Mrs. Ryan... Oh, uh, she's indisposed at the moment. I understand. Must have been a terrible shock. May we see him? This way, gentlemen. If you'll just stand here in the doorway. There he is. Poor Riley. He was a fine chap. Gee, he looks so natural. You did a good job, Digger. <laughs> Thank you. My card, gentlemen. Hard to believe Riley's gone. Yeah. Only yesterday we was playing pinochles. And now... Poor Riley. At least he went fast. You have no idea how fast. <laughs> Mr. Odell, there'll be expenses, and I know Riley wasn't kind to save much, so send the bill to me. And uh, there was some overtime pay that was due him. I brought it here. It amounted to... Uh, <clears throat> $25. What's wrong? I could have sworn I just saw Riley twitch. <laughs> As I was saying, the overtime came to $50. Now, gentlemen, perhaps you'd better be shoveling off. Yes, yes, of course. I extend my condolences to Mrs. Riley, and if there's anything I can do, you, you'll let me know. Yes, of course. Good day, gentlemen. Bye. All right, Riley, you can get up now. Yeah, we, we put it over, we fooled him, we got away with it. He really thought I was dead. Oh, oh Riley. Hey, we got nothing to worry about. Oh, you told him. No, I played dead. <laughs> <laughs> You? What? I had to. <laughs> oh, boy, what a guy won't go through to hold a job. <laughs> you idiot. If you're dead, how can you hold your job? <laughs> what a revolting development this is. <laughs> Now we'll take a short commercial break, and when we return, we'll have a wonderful episode of Our Miss Brooks. Now sit back and enjoy a wonderful episode of Our Miss Brooks. Well, the weather's been pretty nice around Madison High School, where Our Miss Brooks teaches English. That is, up until last week. 
Then the gray clouds cascaded moisture, and the streets danced to the tune of Mother Nature's tears. It was as though some celestial goblet had overturned, caressing the earth with rivulets of heavenly champagne. Or, as we say in my neighborhood, it was wetter than a drowned seal's mustache. <laughs> the rain started Friday morning, and while I was at breakfast with my landlady, she made a piercingly accurate observation. It's certainly coming down, isn't it? <laughs> it sure is, Mrs. Davis. Great weather for ducks. I'll bet the farmers are glad, though. Yeah, it should be good for the crops. It'll keep the dust down, too. <laughs> it isn't the heat, it's the humidity. Now, how did that get in there? <laughs> Would you like another cup of coffee, Connie? No, thanks. I have to get ready for school. Walter Denton's picking me up. Oh, is your car in the shop again? No, but I wouldn't dare drive in this wet weather with my tires in such poor condition. What's wrong with your tires? I only have three. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's Walter now. I'll just be a minute, Walter. <laughs> Will you help me into my rain clothes, Mrs. Davis? Certainly, dear. Here's your yellow slicker right on this chair. Thanks. And your nice yellow rain hat. Now, you're all set. How do I look, Mrs. Davis? Simply divine, Connie. You look just like the trademark on a bottle of cod liver oil. <laughs> well, don't stand there. Throw a halibut over my shoulder. And I'll... <laughs> I'm coming, Walter. So goodbye, Mrs. Davis. Goodbye, Connie. I'm sorry to keep you waiting, Walter. What do you think of this weather? Boy, it's certainly coming down. <laughs> sure is, Walter. Great weather for ducks. I bet the farmers are glad, though. Yeah, it should be good for the crops. It'll keep the dust down, too. <laughs> well, there goes all our dialogue for the trip to school. <laughs> now, if you help me open this car door, I'll... Walter, where's the top to your car? In my garage. I always take it down in weather like this. You do? Yes, ma'am. It leaks. <laughs> well, well, that explains it. We wouldn't want to ride with a leaky top. We might get the rain all wet. <laughs> get in, Miss Brooks. I've got this Turkish towel to throw over our heads. Why spoil it? There's nothing like driving in an open convertible and listening to the pitter-patter of raindrops on your nose. <laughs> the towel isn't just for us, Miss Brooks. I've got to protect my electrical shop homework. Here, uh, hold it, will you? I don't want to seem nosy, Walter, but what is this contraption? It's got wires and tubes all over it. Oh, that's my homework, Miss Brooks. What are you studying, Frankenstein 1? <laughs> no, that's my project for shop. It's an SCR shortwave radio receiver. A radio receiver? Where'd you get it? I built it. That was my project. The electrical shop furnished most of the materials, and I did the rest. Oh, that's wonderful. You kids who are going to school nowadays are certainly fortunate. Just think of it, building your own radios. When I went to school, all I built was an inferiority complex. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that wasn't so tough. Of course, I had to solder a lot of wires in back there, but it turned out pretty good. What's this thing that's sticking out between the tubes that looks like a banana? It's a banana. <laughs> I put my lunch in there to keep it dry. I wish I could get in there. This Turkish towel is getting to be a Turkish bath. Why are you stopping, Walter? I promised to pick up Harriet Conklin this morning, too. But look, there's our beloved principal standing next to the house. Good morning, Mr. Conklin. How do you like the rain? I loathe it, Denton. Thank you. <laughs> Every time it rains, all manner of weird creatures are washed from their natural habitat under stones and come slithering into my driveway. <laughs> and good morning to you, Mr. Conklin. Oh! Oh, Miss Brooks. Oh, for a moment there, I thought Denton had picked up a hitchhiking halibut fisherman. 
<laughs> my daughter will be out in a moment, young man. Meanwhile, please remove that junk heap from my driveway. I'm expecting a furniture van at any moment. Oh, what kind of furniture are you getting, Mr. Conklin? It's custom-built Malacca bamboo. At long last, I'm realizing a dream of mine. To furnish our little glassed-in sleeping porch as a sort of tropical lanai. A place to which I can retreat from the rigors of my daily routine. Oh, I don't know. I think bamboo furniture's kind of icky myself. <laughs> oh, you do. <laughs> What is your opinion of it, Miss Brooks? Well, sir, I... I'm asking your opinion, Miss Brooks. What do you think of bamboo furniture? Well, personally, I'm not too crazy about it. When I want your opinion, I'll ask. <laughs> Hi, Daddy. Oh, good morning, Miss Brooks. Hello, Harriet. Come on, get in. So long, Daddy. Be sure they get the furniture in out of the rain. I will, Harriet. Just to know it's coming makes me feel good all over. My own Shangri-La. Aloha, one and all. Valley <laughs> high and gesundheit. <laughs> hey, would you do me a favor, Miss Brooks? I don't have shop class till the afternoon, and I have biology this morning, so... Would you mind parking this radio in Mr. Boynton's lab for me? But why should I go into Mr. Boynton's lab? Well, because you've got ten minutes before your class starts, and you always manage to sneak in. All right, Walter. <laughs> I'll do it for you as a favor. Thanks, Miss Brooks. Here it is. Now, be careful of it now. I'll see you later. Goodbye, Walter. <clears throat> Hello, Mr. Boynton. May I leave this radio for Walter Denton? It's his shop homework. Oh, certainly, Miss Brooks. Just... Just put it down on my table. Thanks. He'll pick it up next period. There. Say, that's quite a rain costume you've got on. Oh, do you like it? Yes, indeed. It's just the kind I want. I'll bet it makes a wonderful outfit for halibut fishing. There's no use talking. I'll have to burn it. I hope I'm not keeping you from any work, Mr. Boynton. Well, I... Good. <laughs> then we can chat for a few minutes. Oh, very well, Miss Brooks. Let's do that. All right. Okay. Well, if it's checked around to me, I'll have to open. <laughs> Where do you stand on rain, Mr. Boynton? Rain? Well, well, by and large, I'd say that rain is quite beneficial to most forms of plant life. You'll never be investigated for that remark. <laughs> but what I meant was, don't you think it's rather early in the year for such a cold, driving rain? Oh, not at all, Miss Brooks. Our climatic conditions are undergoing a slow but steady change. It's something of a meteorological phenomenon, but do you realize that at this very moment, the equatorial belt is slipping slowly southward? Well, I'll turn my back. You tighten it up. <laughs> what I'm trying to say is that the warm weather which we in the temperate zone have long enjoyed is moving further south every year. It's entirely possible that in the future, our area may be engulfed in icy Arctic weather. How far in the future? Oh, possibly 10,000 years. Good. I should be finished knitting my mittens by then. <laughs> Unless I drop a stitch or two. Come in. Excuse me, Mr. Boynton, but I've got a message from Miss Brooks. How did you happen to look for me here, Harriet? You're kidding, of course. <laughs> Daddy just called and said he'd be delayed with the furniture a while longer and asked me to monitor your class while you sit in this office till he gets here. Well, congratulations, Miss Brooks. What'd I do? Well, this makes you acting principal of Madison. Well, that's right, Miss Brooks. I guess Daddy didn't realize what he was doing. I mean... <laughs> well, all you have to do is answer some phone calls. If you'll excuse me, I've got to stop in at the supply room for a moment. That is, with your permission... Miss Acting Principal. Granted. <laughs> I'll just be a few minutes. See you later. Isn't this Walter's radio, Miss Brooks? Yes, it is. The complicated-looking thing. Let's see if it works. It's pretty close to our first class, Harriet. Listen. Oh, this is swell reception. 
What do you know? Guy Lombardo. <laughs> Heat arrangement, isn't it? And now, ladies and gentlemen, we bring you a special weather bulletin. Oh, good. Maybe the rain's going to stop. Attention, everyone. This is an important announcement. Local weather authorities have just notified us that the barometer is falling rapidly and a hurricane is approaching from the southwest. Miss Brooks, did you hear that? A hurricane! Reports indicate that winds measuring up to 150 miles per hour will strike this area within the hour. Please do not become panicky, but go immediately to places of safety. Mr. Boynton said our climate was changing, but this is ridiculous. Industries will secure all machinery in their plants. And schools will shut down at once. Did you hear that, Miss Brooks? Of course I heard it. I'm listening louder than you are. I repeat. Well, this are you going to shut down the school? I have no authority to do anything like that. Why, of course you have. You're acting principal, aren't you? But you know your father. He'll be furious if I take such a drastic step. I'd better call him. Well, there's no time for that now. Everyone's in great danger. Well, then we'd better ask Mr. Boynton's advice. Come on, Harriet. Mr. Boynton? We will stay on the air and bring you further reports and advice as the hurricane approaches. This is Dudley Hetherington speaking to you from station VUM, situated in the heart of downtown Bombay, India. Well, when Mr. Conklin put Miss Brooks in temporary charge of Madison High School, he had no idea what a crisis would arise in his absence. Not knowing it's from Bombay, Miss Brooks is taking the hurricane report she heard on Walter Denton's radio quite seriously. Hi, Miss Brooks. Did you put my radio in the biology lab? Yes, I did, Walter. I also turned it on and heard a report from the local weather authorities that's got me in the tizzy. And I don't tiz easily. <laughs> More rain coming? Oh, it's worse than that. There's a 150-mile hurricane approaching from the southwest. Well, blow me down. It will if we don't get out of here. <laughs> Let's take Harriet into her father's office to call him up at home, and I'm trying to locate Mr. Boynton. Maybe I can help you. Maybe you can. And when you find him, tell him about the hurricane and bring him to the principal's office at once. <laughs> No use, Miss Brooks. Our phone at home is still busy. I guess your mother's doing her shopping on the phone on account of the rain. No. Mother's spending the day with Aunt Bertha. Mother's her favorite sister, you know. And Mother's crazy about Aunt Bertha, too. I guess it's because she was an only child. Your mother's sister was an only child, Gracie? Uh, Harriet? <laughs> yes, ma'am. She was the only child until Mother was born. <laughs> We haven't much more time, Miss Brooks. The radio says... Here he is, Miss Brooks. So what's all this about a hurricane? It's true, Mr. Boynton. It came over the radio. I heard it, too. The man said it was due to strike this vicinity in an hour. What man said that, Harriet? The announcer. Well, how do you know he meant this vicinity? It's very simple, Mr. Boynton. He said he was quoting local weather authorities. Now, if I'm responsible for the students in this school, I'd better see that they all reach their homes before the storm hits. You mean you're closing the school? Hot dog! <laughs> Miss Brooks, you can't do that. She's got to. Well, this is a very radical step to take. I don't know if I agree with such a procedure. You seem to forget, Mr. Boynton. I'm acting principal of this institution. Oh, my, my apologies, Miss Brooks. You're absolutely right. As principal, your authority exceeds mine in this matter. I await your command. <laughs> At ease. <laughs> Smoke if you like. Walter, you tell the other teachers to dismiss their classes in an orderly fashion and caution them of the approaching storm. Yes, sir, right away. Thank you, ma'am. <laughs> Sorry, Walter. You have to drive us over to Daddy's when you come back. We can't reach him by phone, and he's got to be told what's happening. Okay, Harriet. It's kind of exciting, isn't it, Miss Brooks? We'll all go over together and... All but me, Harriet. As acting principal of this great institution, I feel it's my duty to stay right here and go down with the school. <laughs> no, no, no. You're going right with us, Miss Brooks. Well, of course you are. You've got to report to Daddy. We'll lock the house up tight and see that every... Oh, dear. What if the hurricane hits before we get to the house? What'll you do then, Miss Brooks? What can I do? I'll let it blow and lash myself to Mr. Boynton. <laughs> I 
that Dad doesn't mind our barging in on him like this, Harriet. Well, it's an emergency, Mr. Boynton. He'll understand. Come on. He's probably in his lanai. Daddy, I'm home. That's funny. He isn't in here. No, but the new furniture is. Get a load of this bamboo wilderness. <laughs> it's an odd-looking room, isn't it? How do you like it, Miss Brooks? Now I know where old fishing poles go when they die. <laughs> What's that? I brought my radio along, Miss Brooks. It'll help while away the hours we have to stay holed up here. They care to dance, Harriet? Walter Denton, I'm surprised at you. How can you ask anyone to dance with a hurricane coming any minute? Oh, I'm sorry. It was pretty silly, I guess. It was positively inane. Care to dance, Mr. Boynton? <laughs> You better turn that thing off, Walter. I'm going into the next room and see if Daddy's there. That's his den. I don't hear any growling. <laughs> Be sure and tell him we're here, will you, Harry? I hope he doesn't get angry because Miss Brooks shut down the school. Why should he get angry? I merely did my duty. Come on, let's all go in. No, Harriet, you go in alone. He wouldn't hit a relative. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll just be a minute. Hello, Daddy. Harriet, what are you doing home? What's the meaning of this? Now, take it easy, Daddy. Wait till I close this door. Well, this will probably come as something of a shock to Mr. Conklin. I wonder how he'll react to my closing down the school. Let's keep quiet and listen. Oh, oh. <laughs> she shut down the school! <laughs> <laughs> Miss Brooks, how could you... Possibly. Uh, I'm here too, Mr. Conklin. Hello. Hello. <laughs> Miss Brooks, how could you possibly do. Hello, Mr. Conklin. Hello. <laughs> Miss Brooks, how could you possibly. Hello, Mr. Conklin. <laughs> Hello! <laughs> how could you shut down my school in the middle of the day? But, sir, there's a hurricane coming. We heard it on the radio. That's right, Mr. Conklin. Harriet told me all about it. There's a hurricane blowing in from. Shut up! Southwest. <laughs> I've never heard such a batch of unmitigated jabberwocky in all my days. How could a hurricane possibly get this far into the United States? Smugglers? <laughs> Don't be impertinent, Miss Brooks. Boynton, you always seem to be a person of average intelligence. How could you allow this, this, this mad woman to shut down my school on a ridiculous assumption? But it isn't an assumption, Mr. Conklin. Miss Brooks heard the warning on the radio. So did I, Daddy. And there's no time to waste if we're to get ready for it. Walter, go close all the windows. Yes, ma'am. Denton, come back here. This happens to be my domain. I'll give the orders here. Yes, sir. Go close all the windows. <laughs> I just don't want the rain to ruin things. Hurricanes, indeed. But, Mr. Conklin, we heard... I don't want to hear any more about it. It's too late to call the students back to school, I suppose. But if anything like this ever happens again... Oh, please, I... Daddy. Miss Brooks, turn on the radio. Maybe there's another weather report coming on. That'll convince him. Right, Harriet. Heavy rain squalls and extreme turbulence. All citizens' attention. The following precautionary measures are urged by local authorities for the protection of life and property during the approaching hurricane. I said I don't want to hear any more about... Who said that? Well, the man on the radio, Daddy. Listen. Please follow these emergency measures to the letter. First, precautions against flying glass from wind-shattered windows. Board up all windows. I repeat, board up all windows. Did you hear that? Well, don't stand around like a bunch of dummies! We've got to board up all the windows. <laughs> Luckily, I've got my tool kit handy. I was going to saw some wood for the fireplace. The most secure method of boarding up windows is by using bamboo shoots. <laughs> I repeat, board up your windows with bamboo. Bamboo? Where in the world are we going to get bamboo? <laughs> Oh, no. <laughs> Not my new furniture. Well, this is an emergency, Mr. Conklin. You, you heard it yourself. But I haven't even had time to sit in it yet. Well, take a fast bounce on that couch and we'll start chopping. <laughs> oh, no, no, no. One moment. Just let me sit down for one moment. Adieu, little couch. Stand up on your feet, Mr. Conklin. Here's the toolbox, Mr. Boynton. Let's get started. Oh, I hate to do this, sir, but you know the necessity. I'll turn my back. I can't bear to watch it. 
Oh. Would you like a bullet to bite on? <laughs> Good work, Mr. Boyer. You solved the coffee table right in half. <laughs> Things are bad enough, Miss Brooks. We don't need a commentator. I'll give you a hand to the couch, Mr. Boynton. Pass me the axe. Oh. Shut night. Holy cow, the hurricane's already hit. <laughs> We're cutting this bamboo to board up the windows, Walter. Gosh, I've been missing all the fun. Hand me that axe and stand aside. <laughs> Never mind that, Walter. Take this bamboo strip I've tacked together and nail it up against that window. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, give me the hammer and a nail, Harriet, please. Here, Walter. Was that? Don't look now, Mr. Conklin, but you can pick flowers without opening your window. <laughs> Quiet, everybody. Some more instructions are coming over the air. Be sure to shut up all water pipes and lash down your ox carts. <laughs> Cars? <laughs> New cars must be scarcer than we think. Instruction number three. Attention, everyone. Disperse all natives to the hills. <laughs> I repeat, after costing them to tie down the thatched roofs on their straw huts, disperse all natives to the hills. What natives? Good question. <laughs> Before you repair to your storm cellars, be sure to tether your elephants carefully. <laughs> Remember, tether your elephants carefully. Quick, quick, there's not a minute to lose. I've got to get outside and tether my elephant. <laughs> elephant? <laughs> Mr. Boynton. Did that man say elephants? I thought he did, Mr. Conklin. But who keeps elephants? <laughs> Ever hear of Sabu? <laughs> this concludes our station broadcast until after the hurricane has passed. Good luck to you all from your friendly station, D-U-M, situated in the heart of downtown Bombay, India. <laughs> Well, that, that's a good one. <laughs> the joke is certainly on us. We've been worried about a storm that's 5,000 miles away. Oh, can you imagine that? 5,000 miles. Oh, this is a scream. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yeah, yes, it's a panic. Imagine closing down an entire high school and wrecking a room full of furniture because of a report on some idiot's homemade radio telling of a hurricane 5,000 miles away! Your high blood pressure. Your concern for my blood pressure is touching, Miss Brooks. But I'd rather you concern yourself with what I'm to do about these slivers of bamboo that you've left me with. Please, Mr. Conklin, you can make a fortune with those slivers. A fortune? How? When the flying saucers land, you can clean up selling bamboo canes to those little men. 